Well, good morning and welcome to our study hour this uh, beautiful Sabbath morning here at Croydon Seventh-day Adventist Church coming out to you live on the 22nd of April at 10 o'clock. Um, as always, it's great to be back here and I'm really having a wonderful time uh, <coughs> hosting the uh, Sabbath School study for the month of April. And as you know, we will be continuing to focus on what we have interpreted as uh, the three angels' message sent to God's remnant church via three angels of Revelation 14. The core of this lesson has been prepared by none other than uh, Mark Finley, uh, a great teacher and leader in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Now, as we always say, uh, this is a live interaction Bible study, and we want to hear from you. We want to hear your questions. We want to understand how you think, what your thoughts are. We want to delve into um, how you, we're interpreting God's word and, and, and coming to a united consensus. Um, we also extend a special welcome to those who may be joining us for the first time. Uh, if you haven't already done so, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. You can make a contribution by writing in the chat, on live stream, or on YouTube. Now, if you don't have a study guide, um, it really doesn't matter. Um, you can pick up uh, where you think uh, it's relevant. But if you want to sort of see the format uh, that we're studying, then you're uh, able to access that uh, um, on www.sabbath.school. Um, and you'll be able to sort of follow the sort of gist of what, what we're doing here. As always, a special shout out to radio um, listeners on Adventist Radio London. Um, uh, if you're... Uh, on Adventist Radio London, you can contact us and make a contribution by emailing studio at adventistradio.london. Now, as you know, we always work together. We don't do this by ourselves. We have a, a, a troop of individuals sort of working here. Um, but we also have a co-presenter with me this morning. A warm welcome back to Shanika uh, uh, Benjamin. Good morning. Good morning, Uncle David, and good morning, everyone watching around the world and across different platforms. We're so blessed to have you with us today. Thank you, Shrinika. Also joining us as a panel member uh, is none other than uh, Elder John Bishop, serving uh, our sister church in West Croydon. Thank you so much for joining us, John. Yes, good morning, everybody. As always, a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to sharing the study together. Thank you, John. And we also have in our studio uh, class, Sister uh, Jackie Burton. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure to have you with us. Welcome and happy Sabbath. Uh, welcome and happy Sabbath. It is a pleasure to be here to study God's word with you. Great. Well, let's uh, get into the, the, the lesson. And I just really want, to, before we go into prayer, just to outline one or two things. Uh, we're looking at fear God and give glory to him. Um, and I think just before we do that, let's just ask Shanika to pray for us. Lord, thank you for this Sabbath, the blessing of the Sabbath, which is so needed. And thank you for this time to come together to study your word, to look at your word. Really important, actually, look at your word of just the importance of looking at words. So help us to enjoy this time, to gain a lot from this time and to go forward blessed and ready for the new week when it comes. Holy Spirit, guide us and bless us. Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Janika. Right. Um, last week, we looked at the eternal nature of the everlasting gospel. It has always existed and always will. The eternal gospel is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, Yeshua himself, in the form of the word. The word, as we understand it, is a mechanism for communication, the transfer of information. This is the foundation of everything that is creation, created. Information, the signature of God. Man has used his God-given intellect to discover information in the nucleus of the cell, in every living thing. Deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, there is found coded information that only a mind and intellect can decipher, and therefore only a mind has, could have put it there. The discovery of this information confirms without a shadow of a doubt that God is real and must be feared, respected, listened to, and obeyed. It is in these last days of increased knowledge, technology, artificial intelligence, and the revelation of, uh, uh, of quantum physics, 
where the invisible is now visible and the word of God becomes clear to even the infidel. Listen to uh, what Paul says in Romans 1 verse uh, 20 and 21. It says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Here Paul presents this complaint compelling indictment, um, best applied to the sort of high-tech Laodicea end-time generation who have acquired the technology to see God like no other generation uh, before, but refuses to acknowledge him. Let me again recommend a couple of books which I think really help. Um, You can, as I said before, you can get them on Amazon, uh, The Long War Against God by Dr. Henry Morris and The Great Controversy by Ellen G. White. Um, These provide a real uh, information uh, in regard to the great war which is taking place right now. And we're all participating in that war. Okay, so let's get to the the focus here. I'm going to ask uh, Sister Jackie just to read our text, our memory text, which is uh, taken from Revelation 14, verse 12. So here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. That's Jesus' faith. Okay. So here is the patience of the saints. Here are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. We're going to try and break that down later on in our study. Uh, Shaniqua, fear God. How would you explain this uh, to the man in the street? Who, who could be forgiven for thinking that we are commanded to be scared of God? Can someone obey God and fear God at the same time? Great question. Before I even get around to answer it, I just want to highlight a point that Rodney Smith has made, who wrote to Mark Finley about um, the lesson, who acknowledged that Revelation 14, 15 and 18 presented two more angels, each with a reaping message directed to Jesus who sits on the white horse. So I know it's quite a bit of talk about different angels, just acknowledging that for everyone to see that. So back to the question. Now, I would say, think about school. Now, I remember in school, there was a teacher that used to scare us, really scare us, and she came to teach us maths in year 11, or year 10, and she was saying something that we all knew, but we weren't saying anything. We were really scared to say anything because we were terrified of this teacher. Everyone would do what she said or what she commanded because they were scared of her. I think what my textiles teacher, who I absolutely loved and was just really, really caring to me, really fed into me, I'd do what she said because I respected her and because of the relationship with her. The maths teacher, we came to like her eventually, but the relationship with her, so do what she said because we respected her. God is like my textiles teacher. He's someone that you want to do what he says and you come to respect him and revere him because you love him, because of the way you hold him. So that is what the fear means with the fear God. It's about fearing him, holding him in reverence and awe rather than fearing him because you're scared. And this comes because when you translate things from Greek or Hebrew, the meaning can change in our English language. We don't always have every single word to Set convey what it says. The Greek New Testament word for fear is, in Revelation 14 verse 17, is phobek. I may have said that wrong, please forgive me. And it's used here for a sense of being afraid of God, not being afraid of God, but holding him in reverence, awe, and respect. So we come to God because we want to obey him, because we love him, because we're loyal to him, not because we feel obligated. Mm. Fearing God and doing things out of obligation is not really the same as true obedience. True obedience comes because you love them, you want to make them proud. I come up about my textiles teacher proud all the time, not because I'm scared you're going to tell me off and, you know, look at me in a certain way like my maths teacher used to scare us before at school. Wow. Thank you, Shaniqua. And that brings us to the end of our Sabbath school lesson. Thank you so much. That's really tied up very well. But we're going to dig a little deeper. Uh, again, thank you so much for that wonderful explanation. Fear God. Uh, so we want to get to the heart of the matter. And I just want to clear up a couple of uh, um, issues that uh, came up last week. The three angels' message in Revelation 14.6 is a starting point for three pertinent messages. Uh, 
Now, yes, there are, uh, biblically, other angels carrying important messages of Revelations um, 8 verse 2. Con uh, John outlines in succession the work and messages of seven angels. The seventh angel sounds a trumpet in Revelation 11 uh, verse 15. In Revelation 14 verse 6, we see another angel followed by two others which seem to be linked as warnings appealing directly to the individual person of man. Hence the term three angels, messages that are designed to speak to the soul of every human being who is seeking an explanation for the strange things that are happening in our world today. Now, um, Elder John, can you share with us Revelation 14 verse 7? What is happening here? Um, we, we know this angel has an um, everlasting gospel. Um, he now focuses this message in a particular way. Uh, and I just really want you to compare that with Genesis 12, verse 22. Um, okay. Uh, first of all, I'm going to read from one of my favorite Bible versions. This is the Peshitta, the Aramaic translation of Revelation 14, 7. The reason I'm doing that is because here it says, saying with a great voice, stand in awe of God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of waters. Now, you'll notice that in that version, fear God is here translated as stand in awe of God. In other words, we're talking about reverence, very, very specifically reverence. Now, if we go to Genesis, actually, I believe the passage you want to go to is Genesis chapter 22 and verse 12. If we look at the Greek version of the Old Testament, what you find is that it uses the same word. Now, Shaniqua, I know that you've already tried to massacre the language. I'm going to do the same thing. Um, I'm going to say it's phobio in that verse. The fear that we're talking about in Genesis 22 translates to absolute trust. Abraham was so close to God that he had an unwavering faith in God. And this was the position that God needed to bring him to, the place where Abraham's faith was total and absolute. Or in other words, you say it, I do it. Now, God, in fact, could not have stepped in at any other point, because just for the context, Genesis 22, 12 is where Abraham goes up onto Mount Moriah with his son Isaac to sacrifice him. Mm. And God steps in at the very point where uh, Abraham has the knife raised over his son, ready to offer him as a sacrifice. God took it to that point, not because God wanted to take it to see how far he could actually go, but actually he brought it to the point where it was demonstrated that Abraham's faith was total and absolute. So it is for us that as we come up to the time of the end, we must be in a position where we trust God implicitly. Even if we're surrounded by our enemies, even if there seems no way out, we do not fear anything of this world because we are the children of the King. Wow. So that's what we've got to get to. That's the, mm. the awe and reverence of God. Mm. That, that, that's a, a wonderful uh, a message to me personally because this week has been a very challenging week. Uh, you wake up and you see message after message um, of, of different challenges. I've had uh, family members have, ending up in uh, accident emergency where I've met other friends from our church in accident emergency uh, where uh, uh, towards the end of the week uh, a niece of ours ended up in accident is still there uh, with all kinds of challenges and we've just had to absolutely rely on the fact that God is in control and it gives us an opportunity to draw closer to him and really depend uh, with a, a fantastic confidence that God knows what he's doing and reassure those who are going through this crucible, you remember that, we studied a few quarters ago, um, that he is in control. Now, for our Sabbath school class here in the studio, I would just like you to uh, look at Psalm 89, verse 7. Psalm 89, verse 7, God is greatly to be feared. Um, and it's just not feared, but it says greatly. And um, uh, uh, later on, I'll, I'll, I'm just going to ask you to respond to that, uh, if possible. Now, Jackie, um, can you share with us uh, Ecclesiastes um, 
12 verse 13, according to Solomon, at what point, at one point, he was the uh, wisest man on earth. Um, what is the conclusion here? Well, before I go on to that conclusion, I just wanted to add to what Elder Bishop said. And it's something that's written in the Sabbath school lesson for Friday. And I'm just going to read it. Think about the incredible power of God, the one who created and sustains the entire cosmos, who can, we can barely grasp the idea of cosmos. How then could we even begin to grasp the creator of it? Think about how much greater and vaster and more powerful he is than we are. And this is the God who's going to judge us. So when I think of that, mm. awe is just not even enough to describe who that is. And so am I going to be running scared? No, but I think fear is the right word. Mm. Um, ju I just wanted to say that. Mm. So Ecclesiastes 12, 13 now, all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. Mm. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. And so what I take from these verses is considering Solomon, the wisest man at one point, he had experienced every vice, every pleasure, everything on earth, yet he came all the way back around to say, conclusion of the matter is to fear God and keep his commandments. And um, he wasn't speaking as somebody who might have heard that that was the good thing to do. He was speaking as somebody who has had that experience. Everything we do will be brought into judgment. And indeed, as we live in a period of judgment, we ought to recognize this. Also, as we recognize the true awesomeness of the creator, not just of this earth, but of the universe, like Isaiah, woe is me. You know, you recognize, you're, you recognize who you are compared to God, you know. Um, and as we surrender to his majesty, we are changed and out of our transformation comes an overwhelming desire to please him. We cannot separate that awesomeness and that feeling that we have of God from the obedience that comes next, the, uh, the desire to please him. We can't separate that from him. Um, and we are the ones who benefit mm. more from that obedience. Yes. We benefit immensely yes. from that. Okay. So yes. that's the conclusion of the matter. As far yeah. as Thank you so much, uh, uh, Jackie. We're going to go into the, you know, to a deeper uh, look at the obedience. Uh, in the meantime, we, we have uh, uh, Elder Saul, who um, is with us. She's in the house, and she has uh, a word for us. Yes, good morning. I am going to go back there, too, because... I feel that um, there are certain things which I have learned and understood which I would like to express. Abraham, even though he was, let us say he was a friend of God, offering Isaac to him was a puzzle. According to patriarchs and prophets, he prayed and communed all night, hoping that God will change his mind. He did not know the plan of God. He did not realize at that time, as we do now, that Isaac's blood could not have atoned for the sin of this world. But there were two things with Isaac and Jesus. Jesus, a promised child by God to redeem this world. 
Isaac was also a child that came about because of the power of God. Abraham was to rep represent God on this earth as giving his only son. Because remember, God said to him, not Ishmael, it is Isaac, through himself and Sarah. And he prayed all night. And because he failed twice in trusting God, he had to face that terrible test as well. And so it was then that he was matured enough in his faith with God, even though it was not easy. God did. I wouldn't say God changed his mind, but God let him know hmm. in other way. He did not really want Isaac's blood no. because, as we know, Isaac's blood couldn't atone. No. It was Christ himself. Okay. So Thank he you. gave him that. And the puzzling thing is this. There was no greenery anywhere for any animal to exist there to be caught in a ticket. But God provided that and placed the, 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 the animal there to be sacrificed at that moment. The other thing is with reverence to God. I'm glad for this lesson because I know persons have problems to understand what it really means to reverence God. And so it is clearly outlined. We don't need anything else. Mm. It is clearly outlined. If we don't understand it now, we'll never ever understand it. What it means to reverence God. The mm. greatest respect anyone could give is to give to him. He must always be honored. Mm. And not only when we come to church, but even wherever we are, we must know he's there, he sees us, he hears us, and how he expects us to be and to live, much less when we come into his presence. And that is the thing, when we come into his presence, and not many of us realize how we act and how we speak, it is contrary to him. Mm. But because he's a loving God, yeah. Sister White says, we tend to bring him down to the dirt we walk on. Mm. And we have to learn and know, even though he's a loving, sweet Jesus. Yes. But he's above all. Right. And by his grace, we have, that's why he would like us to live above sin mm -hmm. in all respects. Amen. That all we do will speak of him. Because mm -hmm. if you have had an encounter with Christ, mm -hmm. you will know. Yep. You wouldn't want anyone to tell you. It does something to you deep within. Mm. So when we come to God, fearing God means loving him, respecting him, yes. But there's a quiver that comes within yourself when you realize the hand you touch was not just the person sitting on the street, but for some reason he placed himself there. And so when you touch that hand, and when it vibrates your whole being, you know you have had an encounter with Christ. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sister Saul. That's uh, really, really deep. Um, just uh, before we move on, I think uh, we're just going to move to our, our listeners online just to hear what, what you have to say. This is uh, all about you. We've got some, it's a big subject, so there's a lot to communicate. But yes, uh, Shanika, what's, ha what's happening online? We've got some really interesting comments online. I'm sorry, Rodney Smith, who said, we cannot reverence God with sin in our hearts. And also through Exodus 20, verse 20, which in the New King James Version reads, And Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. And he says, The fear of God is placed before us so that we may not sin. And this is also backed up by Brian's point, who says, God is supposed to be greatly feared because he created everything we see and what we can't see. This is done through keeping and doing his commandments, as in Exodus 20. And he also says, when God descended on Mount Sinai, the thundering lightning caused our forefathers to tremble greatly, and Moses told them not to fear. Mm. And Liz Clark's, Deborah Swartz, sorry, says, the fear of God is the growing awareness of all within a person. 
that God is both mighty and merciful, mm. and there our comprehension stops. Mm. And Liz Clark says, when reading the Testament, sometimes I become fearful of God because mm. of the way he protracted the Israelites by killing off their enemies. But thank God for Jesus Christ. Mm. And then Bev Blake says, to fear God is to reverence him, to place him first in our lives, to love him and live a life that is pleasing to him. It's not to be afraid. And this theme continues. And St. Frumble says, we fear God because of our total respect for who God is, almighty in every dimension of power, love and righteousness. Our minds can hardly begin to conceive and appreciate God's holiness, holy fear. Arlene Samuel says, we are not to be afraid of God, but to reverence him. Right. Acknowledging who he really is. People who are afraid of God do not know how much he loves them, mm. which kind of links to Alana's point on live stream. Mm. To fear God is to acknowledge him as our creator and mm. to love him is our obedience to his laws, realizing the great benefits and beauty those laws offers. Mm. And I will leave you to ponder on this point, everyone, from Dwayne Lawson. Could you imagine what the experience among SDAs and also Bible-believing Christians would be if we fear God and keep his commandments? Mm. Heavenly living on earth, let's try it. Right. <laughs> wow, wonderful comments coming in there. And, um, and not just comments, but uh, uh, communications which, which really touch the heart and mind. Now, uh, just before I go to Elder John, um, uh, we have in our studio... Uh, class, uh, Sister Rose, who you'll recognise. Um, uh, yes, if uh, you have uh, a feedback. Yes, I would just like to answer your question. Good morning, everybody. Certainly. About fearing God. And I have a different perspective to put to it. Now, Matthew 10, 28 says that we must not fear the one who can just kill the body, mm -hmm. but he who can kill body and soul. Now, we all seem to look at fear in a negative way. But fear is a natural, basic human instinct that we are all born with. Mm -hmm. Fear is something that it programs the nervous system and helps the nervous system to have this emotion, this instinct of picking up when we need to protect ourselves. Yeah. So fear makes us alert to danger. Mm -hmm. It prepares us to deal with it. Um, and it tells off of any immediate threat or arm, it mobilizes us and tells us when to move and what to do. When in a frightening situation, what we usually do is we go into what is known as a fight or flight mode, right. which means that what am I going to do? I'm in, a, I'm, I'm in threat, what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. Now, I want to just put that simple basic analogy to when we are talking about mm. God here. So, fear God. If fear is a natural instinct and we are born with it, then it is a, and it's a purpose to alert us from danger, keep us safe, right. tell us how to deal with things. Mm. Then, which two options would you take in a fearful situation right. in regards to dealing with God? Mm -hmm. Because really and truly, despite the fact that we should be at awe <clears throat> with God, we should also fear God, right. really fear God, because yeah. he can kill both yeah. body and soul. Right. So mm -hmm. when we're dealing with God mm -hmm. in awe, mm -hmm. in respect, mm -hmm. what position do you take? Mm -hmm. Fight or flight? Mm -hmm. Do you stand and fight with God? Mm -hmm. Or do you flee in fear mm -hmm. and, and choose the other side? Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, the, um, Proverbs 28, one says, the wicked flee when no one pursues, right. but the righteous stands bold as a lion. Right. Okay. What place do you take? Okay, Rose, thank you so much for, for actually bringing the two m meanings coming out of the same word. One is respect and uh, awe. Uh, the other is related to um, uh, fear, getting ourselves out of danger. And um, there is a dangerous side of breaking God's law or breaking any law. You step off a building, there's a law that says you're going to fall. You need to be fearful of that. Um, at the same time, when you don't break those laws, uh, there are great rewards. Um, John, just going back to you, in um, uh, Ephesians 5.21, how does this fear affect our relationship with each other? Mm, yeah, this is a really good question. And I'd like to approach this by looking at various translations of this verse. Because Paul here in Ephesians 5.21, he's now getting on to what some have called his household code. 
This is how do households, people within the household, relate to each other. And he says in the King James Version, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now, I want to echo what I think Sister Rose was just saying earlier on. Look at the, um, the ESV version. It says submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, because Christ and, or God, there's two alternate readings here. The contemporary English version says honor Christ and put others first. And then my favorite, the Aramaic, it says be subject to one another in the love of the Messiah. So we can look at fear of God as being reverence for God, as being honor to or love of or love for God. So when we put it in the context of Ephesians 5.21, we're saying, how do we relate to each other? Well, let's have love for each other as the basis of the relationship. And I like this idea because it ties in directly with what Jesus said about relationships not only with each other, but also with God. In Matthew 22, verses 36 to 40, here Jesus is asked, what is the great commandment? And he says, the greatest commandment is to love God. And the second greatest is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Mm. So if we follow this in our relationships with each other, mm. how great would that be if yeah. the basis for everything in our relationships was love to one another. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Really broke that text down. Love for one another. Um, I just want to throw this question out at this stage uh, to our listeners. How do we understand the combination of fear, based on how we've broken it down thus far, and obeying God? How are they linked? How are they linked? Elder Saul, you have a contribution to me at this point. Right, thank you. Um, with S Sister Rose, I agree with her. I could remember one day at our study class, we had that to deal with. Fight or flight. That is how we have been made that way. But remember, the qualities God placed within Father Adam, they were all there before sin occurred. They were all going one way, the way that pleases God. Because of sin, some have been distorted. Even you know, our emotions, worst of all, uh, that is having a real sway on everyone. But what will we do according to the question my sister asked? There is a word, help. We summon Christ for help. And he will be there to help us. I know this is true. When you're in a sticky situation and there is nowhere else, there's no one else but him. And you want to move from that. You summon help from him. And as our sister read there, there must not be any grudges, any kind of thing between you when you're relying on God. So say you pray, submit yourself in every way, in for everything. But when you ask him for help, he steps up and he helps you. So he will not leave any of his children to suffer under circumstances of which he can release them. Can I just Thank you. quickly Thank you. come in Thank as well? Much, Sorry, Uncle David. With hmm. some thoughts that are responding sure. to Sister Rose's point, which sure. is really spot up this interesting conversation. Nigel Archer... Um, seems to be in agreement, as we often see fear is negative, but it can have positive benefits, fight or flight. And then we have Maureen Simpson who says, who would like to challenge Sister Rose's concept. I believe fearing God is not to be scared of God, but to hallow his name, revere him, respect him, but not to be scared of him and obey him in fear. And Dwayne Lawson thinks it is a good perspective. Indeed, there is an element of fear of God initially, but then awe and reverence. In the Bible, when angels visit humans, they would say, fear not. And just to throw everything kind of all around the place, Rose on live stream says, the enemy is the one who put fear in our hearts as God does not give us a spirit of fear, but of love and of a sound mind. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, we, 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 uh, you know, this is, this is bound to happen when we look at the, both concepts of fear. 
But I th uh, how I sum it all up is that we need to be fearful of the consequences of falling outside of God's law. God himself is never to be feared in terms of frightened of, but the consequences of breaking God's law is a challenge because God's law is his character. And therefore, that's something to think about. We're going to go on to the next section. It's called fearing and obeying God, which we've touched on to some degree. Um, Sister Jackie, you've got a comment? Yeah. Um, you, you touched on it just now when you spoke, actually. And I, just thinking about, you know, the, the message of Revelation, really part of that message it's a warning message. You don't get a warning if there's, not, if there's not something at stake to be warned about. You don't get a warning if something's not going to happen if you don't do something. And so Revelation is, is a warning. Yes, it's about Christ. Yes, it's, it's about you know, the, the future. But it is a warning. And you don't get a warning if there isn't something at stake. And as you said, David, you know, there's a consequence. Mm. There's something about to happen and you've got to make a decision mm. uh, about which way you're going to go. Thank you. And, and that's a principle that we apply to everyday life. Uh, that's why we have a legal system. At Pusava. If you're driving along uh, on the road, you have signs, which are warnings. You need to stop at this point. Um, and we happily stop. There's no fear. There's no consequence. But something terrible can happen if you break those laws. So fearing and obeying God. Elder John, if you can share with us uh, Deuteronomy 6 verse 2, when we fear God in the way in which we've just been discussing, w what are the long-term benefits? Okay, good. Um, Deuteronomy 6 2 says, that thou mightst fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, and all the days of thy life, that thy days may be prolonged. Now, speaking as an old man, I see a long-term benefit right there, that my days may be prolonged. Then if I add to that, Psalms 37, verse 25, I have been young and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Right there, we've got this long-term benefit. God says, if you actually, if you love me and keep my commandments, you will have a long life. You will have a healthy life because I'm going to look after you. But then the opposite side of that is Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 26, where here we have God speaking through his prophet. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that you will soon utterly perish from off the land whereunto you go over Jordan to possess it. You will not prolong your days upon it, but shall be utterly destroyed. Mm. So here's the counterpoint. My experience is that if I depend on, on myself, if I ignore God, life is a struggle. Yeah. What my, uh, if I then depend on God, if I follow God's ways, mm. I can claim his promises. Yeah. Just like the song that we love to sing, standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, mm -hmm. bound to him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily mm. with the spirit sword, mm. standing on the promises of God. God amen. That's, uh, that, I really love that, standing on the promise. Yeah, and again, it's so important when we worship God and sing these songs, which we've known all our lives, but when we look deep into their messages, uh, it, it's really powerful. Uh, and uh, really relevant to our salvation. Thank you, John, for that. Uh, Sister Jackie, we're looking at uh, Psalm 119, 73 and 74. In the light of uh, what man has discovered about our magnificent bodies, how do these verses show the result of fearing God? So 73 and 74, your hands made me and formed me. Give me understanding to learn your commands. May those who fear you rejoice when they see me, for I have put my hope in your word. Mm. So, so God, who has created each of us, these amazing mm. bodies that we have, look what they're capable of. 
Mm. When, when, when a surrendered life to God is not a secret, a surrendered life to God is not something that's not seen. It's seen in how you keep your body. It's seen in how you reflect the character of Christ. This thing is seen by those around you. And what they see causes you, them to glorify God in what yeah. they can see from you who have surrendered. Yeah. And I think that it's so crucial when we surrender to God, it's seen by others. Yeah. We benefit ourselves, but it is seen it's seen in our face, it's seen in our eyes, it's seen in our demeanor, it's seen in the words that we use towards each other. As Elder John said, you know, the relationships we have are impacted. And so God has created someone who has mm. the ability to reflect the mm. character of Christ that will be seen and will make a difference to mm. those who see what they're seeing. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Jackie. So looking at the way, uh, as, as David was saying, looking at the, the, the way in which we have been created, the way we've been made, and we know more now um, about the intricacies of how we function. Um, you know, even uh, during the COVID um, uh, problem that we had recently, we were focusing on how the immune system works. And it was absolutely amazing to discover how God has built into us an ability to protect our whole being, our whole selves. Elder John, keeping commandments sounds nice and, and, and logical. Mm. Are we not saved by grace and not legalism or force? Okay, yeah. First thing to say, absolutely we are saved by grace. I mean, let's go back to Ephesians. In chapter 2 and verse 5, Paul says, by grace you are saved. In verse 8, he says, by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. However, James then addresses the fact that faith without works is dead. That's James 2, verse 26. And James is then pointing us back to Christ's teachings, in fact, because in John 14 and verse 15, Christ says, if you love me, now, wait a minute, if you love me, this is taking us back to fear God, that idea of the fear also bringing out the love of God. If you love me, Christ says, keep my commandments. So commandment keeping comes from a love of God, a natural outworking of that love. So it's not a question of me saying, okay, I'm going to keep the commandments and then you will have to. No, there's no have to about it. No. Christ said, I've come for you. Don't worry about that. I've come for you. All you've got to do is accept it. And once you accept it, that's it. Wow. Wow. That's it. And, 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 it's, and it's not complicated, uh, John. It's just uh, it's, it's a straightforward response um, that anyone has who actually fears God, in other words, really respects God, understands who God is. I'm reminded in Jeremiah um, Jeremiah, I believe um, it's never a good thing to go uh, into text live without actually having it here, but I hope I'm right. Jeremiah chapter 9, I think 24, 23, probably 24, when it talks about this sequence, it says, you know, if you're going to glory, if you're going to glory, don't glory in, in wisdom, don't glory in, in strength, don't glory in, in wealth, but glory in this, that you know me and you understand me. And, 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 I, and I delight in doing righteousness, and, and I'm a loving and kind God. Yeah? That's what we have to know about God. And as a result, we do what God asks. Uh, well, wonderful. Um, Elder Saul, you, you have a comment. Yes, sir. It was um, a statement which my sister Jackie made that I um, wanted to speak about when she was push, spoke about her bodies. And that made me think of Romans 12, 1, mm. when it says, I beseech you, brethren, that you present yourself a living sacrifice mm. unto God, yep. Yep. which is a reasonable service. Reasonable. Uh, 
uh, the lamb slain in those times, which was something predicted by God, they were dead. Mm. They couldn't speak, they couldn't praise God. But seeing that our Jesus, the living atonement of sacrifice in heaven now, he would like his children to be living sacrifices as well. Sure. Because the sacrifices he require is that of service, living service that pleases him. When we give him praise and adoration, mm -hmm. and we keep thanking him at all times, yeah. praise is comely to God. Praise is satisfying to him. And so, if we remember that, in all that we do, how we take care of our bodies and mm. everything, that is giving praise and thanksgiving to God, mm. which he requires. Okay. Thank you. The Thank other you. thing is about faith and obedience. Faith is a gift from God. Man has no faith within himself. Faith is a gift from God. When we accept him as Lord, by his grace, grace takes us to him. Yes. He, in turn, he gives us a portion of faith, mm -hmm. which is known as the living faith. Why? He is a life giver, and the faith comes from him. Also, the faith has to grow in Christ, by Christ, and through Christ, for Christ. Because man is saved by the saving faith of Jesus Christ Amen. and not of man. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That sort of sums up the whole lesson, I think, in, in one short uh, phrase. Thank you so much, uh, Sister Saul. Um, uh, Shanika, uh, online answers uh, uh, to the questions. What are viewers and listeners saying about fear and obeying God or any other comment that people may have? There is so much good stuff coming in. So I'm going to take a bit of time because there's so many good things. And I'm sorry for those I can't read out. I wanted to read out so many because there's so much brilliance and gems here. Kaku first. It is the fear of God that drives us first to the cross. The forgiveness and second to claim the power of God to cleanse us from the evil that if we were not for the cross would cause us to lose our souls. Aline Samuel says to fear, the God is, to fear God is to place him first in our thinking. It is to renounce our self-centeredness and pride and to live a life holy for him. Anthony Brumble says the combination of fear and obedience are opposite sides of the same coin. This coin is God's love in our hearts. Love me, Jesus asks. Keep my commandments by expressing that love. Brian says fearing God brings about obeying God. When the Holy Spirit enlightens you through the scriptures, how mighty and loving God is, you have to obey him because God is able to destroy those who disobey him. Mm -hmm. This was witnessed by Adam and Eve when they disobeyed God and ate the forbidden fruit. Their son Abel died as a result of disobedience to God. Eleni says, fear being afraid of the consequences of disobeying and living a life without God. But there is no need to be afraid of God. Mm. Dwayne Lawson says, fear in the context of reverence and awe will lead to obedience as you can trust that God has your best interest at heart and he is more powerful than you. Wow. Also, mm -hmm. he knows the future. Maureen Simpson says, as we are created with the ability to choose, then fearing God will be your only option if you choose not to. Following him as the consequences has been foretold. Mm. So the outcome is inevitable. Sure. And then... It's linked to a point from live stream, but Lana's saying from the beginning, we have free will of two choices. Accept mm -hmm. God's way and live or drink of the wine of fornication and die both spiritually mm -hmm. and physically. Mm -hmm. Beverly says, fear God, love God, fear God, appreciate God, mm -hmm. give glory to him. Why? Mm -hmm. Because you fear, are fearfully and wonderfully made. We need to find the best reason to love our creator. Maratha David says, faith plays a big role here because without faith, it is impossible to please him and then we have a comment from tiktok mm. from a user who says greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world yeah. perfect love casts out all fear yeah, and i'm going to finish with this point here which i thought was very interesting from george who mm. says i really believe fear 
should be replaced with reverence or love. Wow. Mm, thank you so much. So many incredible responses out there. God, God is really working in, in helping us to really appreciate and understand the, the, the focus of these messages which we're looking at. Remember, we're looking at the, the three angels' message. We're looking at probably number one, and we're trying to break that down so it's not just something we read and we have no concept of what it means. Now, we've said a lot about what fearing God means and what obeying God means, and it's all well and good us doing that, but we live in a, a, a consumer-driven world. Um, and I just really want um, our listeners to sort of respond to this question. What does it mean to live a God-centered life? So we're taking all of everything that we've been uh, uh, looking at so far and we're now talking about living it, a God-centered life. I've actually put here an Elohim-centered life. That means God, the God that created heaven and earth, because people bow down and worship all sorts of gods these days. So I'm just talking about the one God. What does it mean to live a God-centered life? So that leads us on to our next subject, which is living a God-centered life. Living a God-centered life. We live in a world with so many things drawing our attention, you know, whether it be Bitcoin, what do we do with our savings, do we have a pension, um, you know, uh, you know uh, what car should we buy, or buy next, you know, house, property, you know, everything seems to be filling up uh, our time and energy, our health, our strength. Um, all seems to be the focus of, of someone trying to sort of uh, gain uh, a material gain from our, our suffering or our need. Um, Sister Jackie, can you just share with us Matthew 6, verse 33? Explain this supernatural law for me. Well, 6.33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. And uh, as I was reading, I was reading the verses before and it, it says, you know, don't worry about what you need. Don't worry about the things that you need. God knows that you need those things. But <clears throat> what he then goes on to say is, but seek first his kingdom and all these things will be added because you will, you will, his, all of your needs will be supplied according to his riches in glory. And I made some notes and I actually want you to just read from the Sabbath school lesson, a little bit of what you said there, David, in an age of consumerism, when secular values have made self the center, heaven's appeal is to turn from the tyranny of self-centeredness and the bondage of self-inflated importance and to place God at the center of our lives. For some, it's money. For some, uh, for others, it's pleasure and power. For some, it's sports and music and entertainment. Revelation's message is a clarion call to fear, respect, and honor God and have him as the center of your life. Um, we need to sort out what is our priority. Yeah. You know, what is the priority in my life? Mm -hmm. You know, seeking God first mm -hmm. should be that priority. Mm -hmm. Everything else, you know, God knows I need and he's the one that can supply it. So when I surrender to him, of course, mm. whatever I need, mm. he will supply. There are no limits on what he can do. Mm. So I'm with him. I'm yeah. with Christ. I surrender to him mm. because... When I do that, all of my other needs mm. will come. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we've got to, as you've quite rightly said, seek first the kingdom of God. We've got to believe that going backwards in our study. We've got to believe that. We've got to believe that God actually exists. So many people may say, well, I'm a spiritual person. I believe that there is something spiritual out there. I think there's a guiding force, the force of the universe, etc., 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 which is really challenging for me to listen to. And I'm a good person at heart. You know, they may have these conclusions about their own righteousness. But um, the Bible tells us to fear God. That means that you've got to get to know him. He's a real individual. He's not a figment of people's imagination. And I can testify to the reality of God in my personal life, not based upon so much about what I've read or about what I've heard people preach or teach. It's about the fact that I've encountered God in a real way. I have called upon God to move literal mountains, uh, whether it be health challenges or issues, and he has answered me. That is my testimony. And so you've got to have a real relationship with God that will lead you to a point where you can actually fear him, respect him, love him, and seek first his kingdom because you know what his kingdom 
is all about. I know Jackie's itching to say something, but you have to be quick because we are running out of time, Jackie. I know. Yeah. I just, I just want you to know, it's a bit about what you said there, David, you know, getting to know God, because mm. when you seek his kingdom first, sometimes people say, yeah, well, how do you do that? And it's, it's that prayer life. It's that devotion life. It's that Bible study. It's mm. mission. It's ministry. It's, it's, it's doing all of those things because sometimes it's like, well, seek ye first. What? Well, how do we do it? That's how mm. you get to know him. Mm. His word will tell us. Our okay. prayer lives, the prayers that you've had answered, David, and I've had answered. Mm. These are the things. This is how you practically mm. seek God first. Okay. Thank you so much. Elder John, Colossians 3 verse 1, one of my favorite texts. Can you give me your analysis of this text along with a, a conclusion relative, uh, relative to the man in the street? Okay, let's look. Colossians 3, verse 1. If therefore you are risen with the Messiah, seek that which is above, the place where the Messiah sits at the right side of God. Now, I'm going to start off by saying this. There could be a better translation for this. I'm going to say it, it could better say since you have been raised with Christ. Mm. Now, the analogy here is that of baptism of the newness of life that when I come up from the baptismal grave, I now don't walk, talk, or think like the old man. I am no longer like the pre-baptismal man. Now Christ has given me a new start, a reboot. I am me, version 2.0. Mm. <laughs> Good news is that there's going to be regular updates as well. Yeah. As I walk with God, so he's going to upgrade my software as I go through this life, yeah. trusting in him. So now everything should be filtered through this idea. It, is, it's, it seems a bit trite, but I love this saying, what would Jesus do in every situation? What would Jesus do? What would Jesus say? What would Jesus think in every situation of our lives? And this is the key to a Christ-centered, Christ-driven life, keeping that ultimate goal in mind at all times. Yes, I might, you know, the carnal man might lust after the things of this earth, and there are certain things that I like to have, but since I am risen with the Messiah, That's right. now seek that which is above because yep. all of this down here is going to pass away yep i'm looking for the eternal yep. not the temporary okay thank you so much uh elder john because that, that's the issue because the man in the street will ask you what's what's driving you you know you, you you've got to live you know what if this happens what if that happens what if you lose a job and i you know what if i serve a mighty god i'm not focusing on the things of this life because he always provides. Uh, I'm just going to go, before um, we go to you, Jackie, um, Sister Rose, if you can come up with a, a quick point, because, you know, we have to sort of compress things as we come to the end of, 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 the, of the lesson. Yes, I'm going to skip all the preamble and just go to Psalms 105 in regards to God being the center and, and glorifying God. Psalms 105 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing to him. Sing psalms to him. Talk of all his wondrous works. Glorify his holy name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face evermore. That is a God-centered life. Right. Wow. Thank you so much. Sister Jackie, Hebrews 12, 1 to 2. Such a powerful text. Uh, how do you interpret this, this text in the short time that we have? Okay. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a greater cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders the sin that easily is entangles us and let us run with perseverance the race marked for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him he endured the cross, scorning his shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. Mm -hmm. If Christ, knowing what was before him, could lay down his will mm -hmm. and submit to his father, we ought to do nothing mm -hmm. but the same. Mm -hmm. We ought to lay down 
all of our will. This battle is for our mind, mm. and we are to surrender it to Christ. Mm. Um, we can only pers persevere if we have the faith of Jesus, the same faith that gave him victory will give us victory. Mm. Um, and we're called to surrender to him. He surrendered to his father and he created the world. Why would we do anything different? Yeah. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, you know, there, we're seeing here that there is a supernatural element to uh, living a God-centered life. Uh, this is something that we must understand. God has given us an investigative and intelligence that can reason and challenge the narrative of this world. No God, everything evolved, gender dysphoria. There is a battle being waged, and that battle is for the mind, the will that is within our citadel, within the soul of every being. That's something that we need to understand. We haven't just evolved. We're not just bits of biological mechanisms that have no hope, no focus. Yeah, There's something more. Shanika, um, online, what are our viewers saying to the question of what it means to live a God-centered life? Lots of good things, again, and lots of good comments on TikTok as well. It's great to have you engaging with us. I'll start with Renee, who says, living in obedience, studying the word, seeking him on a daily basis. And then we have another comment that says, seeking first the kingdom of God before doing anything and praying continually, which links to this comment from Eliz Clark. A God-centered life is when all our beings are solely focused on God despite what comes our way. We've got another comment that says, living the written word is living a God-centered life. I love this really interesting point from Anthony Brumble. When we think of living a God-centered life, we can consider the hexagonal structure of God's love slash our creation. Six days parallel the size of the hexagon and its center is God's love from which all exists. Wow. Ruby Raddick says, choose to allow God to give you the mind of Christ. Mm. Think about heavenly things, mm. say no to sin, Make no provision to the flesh. Zuminta says, A God-centered life is to have that relationship with him where he is our all in all, where we live, mm. eat, breathe everything that God wants us to do, where the world will see him in us Amen. daily. And I will end with this comment from Angela Hannon who says, Living a God-centered life includes recognizing that we have a lot to deal with in this life. But we need to create a real relationship with God first, that we can see our problems mm. through God's eyes. Thank you so much. And that last point is so pertinent um, that, you know, in this complex world, more and more people are being challenged. Mental health issues are, are increasing. No one has got any solutions. The only solution is the one which they've thrown away. And that which they've thrown away is God, throwing him out of the business, throwing him out of, out of the school. And sometimes now throwing him out of the church. Mm. He mm. is the solution. And walking with him is the only way we're going to have a sound mind. Um, now, over the years, uh, a question going out. Over the years, being in the church most of my life, I've heard people say that God must be glorified. And I'm asking you this question. What does real glorification of God really mean and look like? What does it look like? Okay, moving on. Elder Saul, as you know, we're coming to the end. We only have yes, a few yes, minutes. You yes, have to be to the yes, point sir. and sure. Yes, Thank sir. You. Yes, sir. I agree with all that has been said. But I would like to add, a Christ-centered life is being a disciple of Christ. We do not come overnight by it or by our own means. It is true Christ. And so every day we must surrender to him <clears throat> our sinful will, which is a force within us. That is the ability to act. Surrender it to him each day that his divine will will control our will and we will be subjected to him according to her desire. And so we thank you. Time is going. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, always wonderful to hear from you, but as you know, we're, we're governed by the clock. Sister Jackie, um, uh, you know, can you share with us uh, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31? Uh, you know, uh, for those of you who don't know, Sister Jackie is the health ministry's leader here at Croydon. Uh, and on that basis, uh, uh, Sister Jackie, do you see anything in this verse that would support or underpin the essence of your ministry? Well, whatever you 
eat, whatever you drink, or whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. Now, it talks about food here, but it says whatever you do, whatever you do, whatever you do within this body temple. This body temple was created so that God would dwell within. When you think of the places that earthly royalty dwell, the best is set aside for them. Where is Christ dwelling? Where is the Holy Spirit dwelling within our body temples? What do some of them look like? What are we treating some of them like? What are we putting inside of those bodies? Yeah. What is coming out of those bodies? What mm -hmm. is coming out of the mouth of those bodies? Mm -hmm. You know, what are we representing? Yeah. You know, the Holy Spirit is to dwell within us. Yeah. How are we treating our bodies? Are we respecting the health that we have, mm -hmm. once had, what need to have? Okay. Honestly, yeah. it, it, I could go on, yes, but I, I know that time is short. Great, thank you so much. So yes, these bodies, we glorify God by allowing God to use these bodies, to live in these bodies, that our bodies are sanctified. Elder John, what is Paul begging us to do here in Romans 12, 1 to 2? Okay, I'm not, I'm not going to quote it for the sake of time, but we can look it up for ourselves. But basically, Paul here is reminding us that forgiveness also brings with it this renewing of life. So what have we got to give to God? Well, only ourselves. So Paul is saying to us here, take this seriously. If you really are me 2.0, then we should, in fact, we must recognize that the doctrine of righteousness by faith and salvation by grace doesn't encourage lawlessness or a careless disregard of God's commandments. In fact, it's the opposite. The believer who's been justified and is being sanctified becomes ever more willing to obey as the righteousness of the law, as Paul says in Romans 8.4, mm -hmm. is being fulfilled in him. Mm -hmm. So in love and in gratitude, we seek ever more earnestly to know, to understand, and perform the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Yes, it certainly leads to an incredible transformation of the mind capable of receiving the renewed life of Christ. Um, any comments online, Janika? Just one or two, just uh, uh, before we sort of move into the last part of our program. Yeah, um, linking to Aunt Jackie's point, Gles says, can we give glory to God if we do not take care of physical health? Then we've got someone on TikTok saying, glorification of God is letting your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And it's like Pastor Royston, it's like you on TikTok saying glorification is when your lifestyle, attitude and decision are Christ-like and Christ-centered. Mm. I'll give one from live stream. Alana says our lives, thoughts, words and actions should reflect God's characteristics. Mm. And I'll end with this one from Anthony Brumble, which says Psalm 24 gives us keys to how we glorify God. Okay. Lifting the gates of our minds, let the King of glory come in, mm. the Holy Spirit within and God shining out of us. Okay, right. Okay, thank you so much. Um, a, a question I, I'm going to put out there, I and mean, you're probably going to have to discuss this over lunch. We probably won't have a chance for you to answer this. But in Revelations 14, 12, it talks about the faith of Jesus Christ. Should that really be faith in Jesus or does the subtle difference make a big difference? So uh, have a look at that question and let me know what you think. Elder, Elder John, um, if we're looking at um, Hebrews 4, verses 14 to 16, there's a lot of theology going on there and we won't have time to unpack it. But if, if you could just uh, give us some insight there, please. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's really kind of bring it down to the last minute and then go for these ones. Um, this, is, this is really, there, as you say, there is so much there. But basically, let's bring it down to the nutshell. Christ is there in heaven. Who is this Christ? Is he a remote God that sits in heaven and says, well, you guys crack on, make the best of life? No, this is the living man, Jesus Christ, who now as man, but also as God is in heaven, working as our high priest. Mm. When we go to him, we don't, we don't go to Christ saying, you've got no idea what it's like down here. Mm because he's got absolutely every idea. Right. There's another scripture that I disagree with here, mm -hmm. it, where we're told in the Bible that Christ was tempted in every way, 
in, in the same way that we are tempted. Mm -hmm. And I disagree with that, and I say, no, he wasn't. He was tempted more than we can ever be tempted because when he was on the cross and the temptation was, well, if you really are the Messiah, then get down off the cross and show it. He could have got down off the cross. Yeah. Christ has not only been where we've been, he's been much further than us. Yeah. We don't go to him and say, you've got no idea. Yes, he has every idea. That's mm -hmm. how come he as God is able to sympathize with us and to say, look, I am here, surrender yourself to me, mm. I will give you the power to overcome. And, and, and John, while you're on the line there, in Jesus or not? Um, the faith of Jesus faith of, or right. faith in Jesus? Very quickly. Yeah. Now, it can be done either way. Yeah. Both are correct. Mm -hmm. We should have faith in Jesus because he has done it. We can trust him. But also, we should have the faith of Jesus. That means Jesus' faith, in a nutshell, he said, not my will, but thy will be mm -hmm. done. Mm -hmm. That's the faith we need to have. To say to God, not what I want. I'm mm. going to trust in you because mm. you know better than I do. Mm. And you know the end from the beginning. So right. I'm going to have faith in right. you like you had faith in your father. Absolutely one. So having the faith in Jesus that he will give you the faith of Jesus. It's, it's, a, it's a powerful Amen. thing. Now, everything that leads to creation and perfection is governed by law, God's law. This is the quest of our science community to discover the laws of life and so that they can be obeyed and, and the rewards um, harvested. This leads to the production and growth of every discipline from finance to microbiology. The beauty of the flower, when studied under the microscope, just visualizes more law, more perfection, more joy to the eye of the beholder. Today, we see that man is driven by demonic and despotic forces, um, and they're trying to remove God from our society and replace it with a total confusion and therefore destruction. This destruction uh, that we are witnessing is what God is trying to save us from. The only solution is to fear God and give glory to him. Why? Because judgment has come. Now, um, this is, uh, we've sadly come to the end of our, of our hour. I just want to ask you, Jackie, what are your final thoughts? Wow. I had so many things written down. Revelation is about Jesus and victory. Mike. We... Mike. Mike. It's, about Reve it's about Jesus and victory. It also, um, the battles for the mind. Mm. We need to recognize that that great controversy is uh, all about the mind and also that Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. There are no limits to what Jesus can do. And so therefore, whatever, whatever I do, when I surrender and trust him, it's Jesus who is doing that through my life. And I just, I just am so thankful that I have him on my side so that he can do in me and through me everything that I need to do to be saved and to be victorious. He's already got the victory. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. He's always got the victory. We've got to understand and appreciate that. Uh, uh, and the sister Saul, Elder Saul, pointed out earlier that he is the focus of everything. Um, he's not just a high priest. Um, uh, as, uh, we, which we didn't manage to touch on earlier. But he's not just a high priest. He is there. Um, you know, we have this idea of a high priest swinging uh, incense and with a funny hat and everything else. No, he is there tweaking uh, the focus of our salvation. We come to God and we may have a propensity to, 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 to have a problem with a particular sin. He tweaks it and adjusts it. We may be uh, powerful in one area. He tweaks that and presents us perfect before God. Uh, Shaniqua, have we got any final online um, comments uh, that we can share? Yeah, I'm going to leave with these three comments, which link really lovely. Lynn Joe says, we need the faith of Jesus to overcome like he did, which links to Rodney Smith's point. Sin is the only thing that separates us from God. We bring glory to God when we accept his solution to the sin problem, Amen. Jesus. Mm. And what kind of sums up everything we've been talking about perfectly in this very simple short sentence from David Springer? Faith of Jesus means obedience. 
Wow, wow. And uh, Shinika, what are your final thoughts? Oh, what well, are my final thoughts? I was just trying to champion the people. Um, <laughs> my final thoughts are really love God, get to know him for yourself. And the more you do that through the love of Jesus' sacrifice and the, and the Holy Spirit dwelling within you, you'll want to serve him. You will want to obey him. And you won't want to be living in sin anymore, which is what really we should be fearing, the results of sin, which is hell, which we don't want to go to. But we don't need to fear God because he loves us and he is amazing and he's got our back all the time. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, there's so much to pack into this. Um, and uh, we thought we'd just hear from you, Elder Saul, uh, with your final thought here uh, in the few seconds that we have. My final thought is that it doesn't matter what we do. Jesus is the one. Christ Jesus. It is by him he made, he died, and he's the one that will save us. No one else. Uh, that's it. Uh, you know, that focus upon Christ, and we've got to understand the mechanism for that. Elder John, your final thoughts in the last minute. Yes, okay. Last minute. Let's see if we can get it all down. Yeah. What's the title? Fear God and give glory to him. How do we fear God? Well, as we've looked at the meaning of this word, really, it's not just to be in awe of, it's not just a reverence, but it's to love God. Yeah. How do I show my love for God? Mm. By having the faith of the faith in Jesus so that I walk my life as a Christian representative on this earth. This is how I give glory to God, by reflecting God, by revealing God to those around me. Finish on a song. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. So that's my final thought. Yes. Faith is the victory. Have faith in Christ. Okay, well, thank you so much, John, and thank you, everyone that has joined us today. It's been a packed lesson, so much to try and unravel, but um, we're here. We've come to the, uh, the end of uh, our Bible study uh, this morning. Um, in a few minutes, I pray that you'll join us uh, in the main church. Um, just to remind you that we do have a, a Reflecting Hope program. You would have seen the, the adverts come up. That will be taking place between the 13th and the 27th of May here at Croydon. Do tune in on weekdays at 7.30 on Saturday or Sabbath at 5.30. So uh, we've got something special in store for you. So again, thank you so much for joining us. Your comments have been absolutely marvelous. I've been blessed. And um, do join us again. Next week, we'll be looking at the good news of the judgment, the good news of the judgment. Let us bow our heads at this time. Father God, we thank you for being with us, guiding us, directing us, strengthening us, and allowing us to have this incredible, wonderful, one-to-one -one relationship with you. We pray now that you'll bless us, guide us, and allow us to continue basking in the sunshine of your blessings on this beautiful, wonderful Shabbat day. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.